sorry that I, because I was committed to another workshop, I wasn't here in the morning, but it's a lot of uh, exciting stuff, but good work, Sandy. <laughs> you predicted that class? No, no, no. Uh, that, was, that was last um, there's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm curious, um, uh, how many people saw one of the other jobs that I gave in the works? <laughs> All right, good. So I'll go very quickly over a little. There's a little bit of overlap, and I, I won't say very much about it. Um, so the reason why I'm I mean I'm interested in, in word meanings and semantics um, because I come from cognitive science and it's absolutely central to human cognition. But I'm also interested in it and interested in studying it in the context of NIPs and machine learning because I think when you study how we learn semantics, it, it forces us to, to to change and enlarge and enrich our idea of learning. There's this paradigm that you know, NIPS is built on, basically. It's this idea that learning is statistics on a grand scale, taking data at high dimensions, finding structure, supervised, unsupervised learning. It's all about finding structure in high dimensional data. And we know how to capture this in, in the math of optimization. We know how to implement some of this in net, you know, networks of neuron-like units. We know how to relate it to neural networks in the brain. That's what NIPS is about. And this kind of math, taking, taking it outside of the neuroscience context, has been really useful in buildings with real world useful systems that you know start to realize something that looks kind of like the promise of AI, whether it's you know, face and pedestrian detection or Google, you know, it's, it becomes commonplace, but it's, it's worth still recognizing, particularly when we're talking about learning semantics, that, that Google, you might not have thought of it originally as an AI system, but it's, it's you know, basically the world's best AI semantic system that anybody could have imagined if you, certainly if you went back to the early days of AI, people would have been impressed at that achievement. Or, you know, maybe most recently, um, the IBM Watson system for playing Jeopardy, which beat some, you know, some of the world's champions at this game. These are systems that take real-world language data and, and definitely get some kind of meaning out of them. But I want to highlight what some of the limitations of these systems are because they sort of, you know, point the way towards the need to actually understand semantics, and I think it's going to require enlarging our toolkit of statistical learning. So just a couple of, of my favorite examples here. Um, Google spelling correction, again, you might not think of this as a semantic exercise, it's a statistical pattern recognizer, and it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's basically n-gram technology, which is at the heart also of a lot of other applied NLP tasks. It, it works amazingly well. You can type in a slightly garbled version of that query, you can all read it, Google not only reads it, but gives you a useful answer. But now take something like this. Um, anyone want to read this? It's kind of hard to read, but and let me... This is you something. Something, yeah. Let me rearrange the, the order of the words. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah. right. okay. So all I did between here and here was rearrange the order of the words. And of course, you might have seen people send these things around on email, these little cute examples. It turns out you can re you know, rearrange the the letters pretty much massively within words, and people can still read it if you preserve two things. You have to preserve the this, this sequential structure of the sentence, and it has to be a meaningful sentence. So I would say this shows that our intuitive abilities, our natural cognitive abilities for, for you know, finding the signal and noise of language. Um, you might not have thought of spelling correction as a semantic exercise, but I think that's, that's a, a very concrete way to see it. Um, of course, Google has nothing to say about it. <laughs> uh, IBM Watson, again, this is impressive. Um, has any, did anybody watch this, this thing on, on TV? Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, to, to, uh, to me, the, the neatest thing about, you can watch these on, on YouTube here. I'm just gonna... Read in the 40 PhDs number. Uh, some thing. Okay, <laughs> I mean, some, some article they wrote. They have a staff of engineers, 40 PhD engineers. Not no, really group. Group. I, It depends how many we count. count, but... Wow. Pretty good. Like okay, so the key thing to look at here is, yeah, look at the, the second and third choices. It's neat yeah. that they show you their first choice and then the second and third one. Um, didn't quite get that one. But the, the most striking thing to me is how, how often it is the case that, regardless of whether... A thief, a part of an arm. Regardless of whether uh, uh, Watson gets the right answer, this, the second and third choices are often make no sense at all. They're like in completely semantically anomalous. Um, so that's not one's pretty good. Um, Yeah, we're the 20s. No. Watson, what is 1920s? No. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it has no speech recognition, so it doesn't know what the other people say. Uh, that, that may be true. Yeah. Um, 
stylish, elegant or students who all graduated in the same year. Watson, what is cheap? No, sorry. Brad, where's class? Class, you got it. Okay, what? anyway, you, you, got that, you, can, you, can, you can watch this. I just picked a random point. I don't know if it's particularly good or bad, but you can see cases where where it's where it's definitely saying things that are not they're not just like sort of wrong answers, but they're just like you know answers that no human would ever would ever think of. So what's the gap here? Well, uh, you know, without saying too much about how you built these systems, which are really impressive achievements, I don't want to diminish them. I and many cognitive scientists are trying to understand in computational terms how children are able to learn the abstract meanings of words. And what I thought I'd do here is just give a sort of survey. Um, of some of the work that we and other people in our field have been doing, trying to get at some of the really interesting things about how humans learn uh, words. And it, I guess I titled the talk towards more human-like machine learning. Most of the things I'm going to talk about here aren't really very uh, useful machine learning techniques. They're more like using the language of machine learning and stretching it to tackle the human learning of semantic uh, concepts in ways that hopefully will be somewhat inspiring for machine learning people to try to move more in this direction. In, in the kinds of applications that uh, we care about in that field. So some of the things that we're interested in are how children can do one-shot learning, how we can learn the meanings of words from very few examples, and how that's supported by what, what we could call a kind of learning to learn. So this is something I talked about in, in one of the morning workshops, and I'll just go very, very quickly over that. But then focus more on abstraction, like how we can learn abstract concepts or types of concepts, Co concepts that have that correspond to word meanings, but don't actually have a direct perceptual correlate. That doesn't mean they aren't grounded. What we'll see is that these concepts are grounded, but they're kind of cognitively grounded. They're grounded in, as, as part of the role they play in an intuitive theory, and then that theory grounds out of perception. Um, we, we're very interested in learning context-sensitive language. Like, we'll show you even just very simple adjectives, for example, that you might take for granted you think you know what they mean. It turns out to be quite subtle to describe what they mean, and you need to use interesting kinds of programs to describe how they work. Uh, or function words, words again that, like the or every or three or or of, words that don't seem to have any direct reference, but they're the glue of compositional semantics that help give language at the level of a sentence its meaning. Um, I think that's probably enough of what I have to say here, and I'll just sort of try to give a tour and emphasize a couple of themes, um, ideas, no, we don't have that. <laughs> um, ideas that, that, that we think, um, you know, to our thesis can, can explain how human children are able to learn these things, the idea of Bayesian learning over probabilistic models with certain kinds of forms that sort of go beyond the simplest kind of machine learning, learning toolkit. They often have rich hierarchical structure, they often capture the generative processes or the causal process of the world in richer ways than we you know, currently are used to tackling in machine learning. And then what's you know, really the, at the heart of semantics is they have this compositional language of thought character to them. And I think that's a theme that's, though I, I, I didn't see a lot of the talks in the workshop so far, it's certainly a theme that, that I, I think people have been emphasizing, certainly the last talk, um, and it's, it's really what, what brings us here. Um, just, just one other kind of motivating example, and I'll come back to this at the end. Um, I'm very interested in the, the, the origins of, sort of the ultimate origins of knowledge, and I think it, it, it highlights uh, some of the issues in semantic acquisition that people in developmental psychology have focused on looking at analogies between children's learning and the origins of scientific theories. So if you ask yourself, you know, how did Newton learn or, or come to this knowledge like the universal law of gravitation, um, or how did Mendel come to his theory of genetics, you know, they observed data, and arguably, particularly in, in, in uh, Mendel's case, we're all very familiar with that, but even in Newton's case where the, the astronomical data was pretty noisy, there's a kind of statistical inference, right? You can't just deductively read these things off of the data, but you also can't just crunch them through some learning algorithm. There's no, as far as we know, uh, you know sort of convex optimization problem that leads to this being the output of you know, the, the best description uh, for the orbits of the planets, right? Or, or this theory you know, specifying the idea of genes and, and uh, alleles and dominant and recessive and the whole sort of you know, uh, combinatorial structure that, that Mendel came up with there. Um, rather, it's something more like a kind of program induction, and this is a concept that um, is, you know, it's a sort of a scary one, but I think many of us who are interested in learning semantics, sooner or later, come, come down to it or come back to it, right? So that somehow you could imagine that there's, there's some kind of program that describes that, that semantic content of one of these theories, like you know, the theory of natural selection that leads to the origin of species, or something, you could, you could express Newton's laws as a kind of program, 
that was maybe a probabilistic program in order to explain the noisy data. And certainly Mendel's genetics is a classic kind of probabilistic program where you, you, you have abstract functions and put probabilities on the things you don't know and like the, the latent variables, the original uh, genetic state of the population that you start off before you cross several generations. And then you compare different hypotheses which correspond to different different models in this space of probabilistic programs, you compare their predictions on the data. And some, you know, broadly speaking, Bayesian approach, where you have a prior that tends to favor simpler or shorter programs, and you have a likelihood which is how well these stochastic programs can capture the distribution of your observations. That at least gives you a kind of a scoring function, and then you face this terribly difficult and terribly scary search problem. But while, you know, it's our best understanding that, that that's you know, a way to think about um, the, the origins of scientific knowledge, I think that when we start, to, you know, we start to think about uh, semantics, we're going to be coming back to things like that. So I'll go very quickly through some of these word learning things. In fact, I could probably just skip it, except I want to just highlight how, how working on these problems started to get us thinking in, in terms of program induction. We want to understand how, given just a few examples like that, you can you can learn this word. And it's, you know, it, it's some of you probably saw this slide before, but. Again, it's not very hard to see with those several tufas. You can say, well, that one up there on the upper left is a tufa. The one below it isn't. The one below that, the third one down isn't, but the one to the right probably is. And we can think about what's going on here is we're forming some hypothesis space that captures the structure of these objects. Something like an evolutionary program. It doesn't have to have natural selection in it, but something like, you know, if you saw the, uh, if you've seen some of the sort of coalescent-based hierarchical clustering models, some kind of hierarchical tree structure that explains how these objects might might be derived and where the, the, you know, there's, there's some kind of branching process that captures these super categories like you could say all of these are some kind of funny plants and that corresponds to a high level branch. These tufas down here are maybe some corresponding to this branch. And by taking this by taking this sort of un, you know, unlabeled set of objects and deriving something like this kind of a hierarchical causal generative model, you can generate a hypothesis space for word learning, where the words would now map onto branches of this tree. And that turns out to, to be a reasonable way to capture how children learn and generalize one or a few examples in this sort of word learning setting. But I don't want to dwell on this. I want to focus on the, the questions of where the hypothesis space come from. Like, how do you know what, what are the relevant features of objects to explain with something like a tree structured model? Well, this is the kind of thing that, that again, I talked about this in, in, in the earlier morning talk in one of the other workshops, and I won't go into it so much, but this is work that Russ Solkudinov and I have been doing, also with Antonio Taralba, where we've been trying to understand something about how you can learn what features count for word learning. And it's, again, this idea of a, a tree-structured uh, kind of model that captures classes and superclasses to be able to say some, there's, there's some sense in which similar categories have similar similarity metrics, and, Using this idea, we can uh, you know, learn from multiple related examples of different classes, and we think this is a, this is a basic thing that human children are able to do. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's been really interesting work in developmental psychology explaining something about how, how uh, trying to capture how children's, um, I'm realizing this is, I'm trying to compress a whole talk into a couple of slides, and it's probably no, not going to make sense to anybody. But, um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, the really interesting work that developmental psychologists have done in trying to um, tr trying to explain how children's word learning accelerates very dramatically around the, around the, say, between one and a half and two years of age, and this kind of learning to learn in a hierarchical Bayesian model is is a is a compelling way we found to describe it. I think I'll just say, check out this that, this paper that Russ and I wrote if you're interested in that, and come to it come to our first sort of program induction kind of case, which is to say, well. It's, it's one thing to, to uh, be learning to learn in a hierarchical Bayesian model, but how do you get the idea that you should be building some kind of a tree-structured representation at all? And in, this is work that Charles Kemp and I did, where we tried to describe very simple kinds of programs that could capture the abstract structural form of different kinds of representations. To, to be able to say, well, you see something like objects, which are you know, animals or plants, they have some features, and to recognize that something like a tree structure, this is a, a tree that's learned from a, a data set of um, animals and their features, uh, is, it's, it is, is the best way to capture the structure there, not as in, say, just going in with a hierarchical clustering algorithm and, and just sorting things hierarchically, assuming that's what you're looking for, but actually trying to learn that for this data set, something like tree structure is the right way to capture what's going on. And what Charles came up with a clever way to do that is by giving, basically giving simple kinds of graph grammars, which are very simple kinds of programs for growing out structures, 
And then by doing inference in a hierarchical Bayesian model, where the top level is some kind of a very simple rule for growing graphs, and then that, that basically generates a prior on models which are with that, at the level below that, which then using some of the tools of basically Gaussian graphical models, the, the standard kinds of ideas where you define some kind of smooth distribution of, of uh, features over these objects with a uh, sort of a covariance structure of a Gaussian process that corresponds to the, to the inverse of the graph Laplacian, sort of fancy language for basically saying things that are nearby in the graph tend to have the same features. That's a way, if you do inference in this hierarchical model, to learn not only the best, say, tree structured graph, but to learn the very idea of a tree by scoring at the top level these qualitatively different programs for growing different kinds of structural forms of representation. And you apply that same kind of framework to, say, uh, voting data. In this case, this is how the US Supreme Court judges voted on a series of bunch of cases. And there you discover a qualitatively different structure, this linear left-right structure, with the more liberal judges over on the left and the more conservative ones over on the right. Um, you, you can take cross products of simple structural forms and get, for example, uh, you take the, the distances between cities on the globe and you get this uh, cross of a chain and a ring. So it's sort of a, cr a cross product of two simple graph grammars, which corresponds to latitude and longitude. Or you take, for example, data on faces where we, we generated these with a face synthesizing program, which varied the, the, the uh, race and the masculinity gender dimension of the faces. And there, this algorithm discovered that a cross of two chain structure rules gives this is the best way to describe what's going on in that data. The reason why I want to highlight this from a semantic point of view is to say, well, if we, you know, if we want to learn representations, we could do unsupervised learning in any kind of compressive system. We could use a deep belief net. We could use a Boltzmann machine, whatever. But having a model like this extracts representations with this abstract structural form that is semantically meaningful. Right? In, in, in biology, these internal nodes of the tree, those have names too, like fish or mammal. Right? In this case, when we talk about liberal or conservative, we talk about left and right, what we're talking about are parts of the structure. Those are more abstract concepts that in order to even understand what those words mean, you have to know that you're talking about this one-dimensional spectrum or latitude and longitude. What do those words mean? They refer to the abstract parts of this form. They don't correspond to individual concepts or nodes that we started off with. But in some sense, the, the possible meanings of those words are discovered by this kind of an algorithm, or you know, these dimensions here, where we talk about you know, masculinity, or we talk about black or white or racial dimensions or ethnicity. Again, those, those words matter, and their semantics are, in a sense, you know, this isn't a word learning model, but it's a model that's able to discover the kinds of concepts that could be the semantics of those abstractions. So this is work that, you know, sort of summarizing stuff that, that we did up until a few years ago. And then what we've been doing more recently is really getting more at language. And so I just want to tell you about work of a couple of students from our group. Um, one comes from a thesis by Lauren Schmidt, who is studying uh, learning context-sensitive meanings in the particular case of gradable adjectives. Uh, since I wasn't here this morning, I'm not sure if people already talked about this. Anybody talk about adjectives like tall? I don't want to rehearse a familiar example if it, if it is. But it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, right? I mean, these are very simple words like tall, short, heavy, light, strong, good. And we might think that their meaning should be pretty simple too, right? What I mean, tall is basically we all know tall when we see it, right? Uh, you know, the higher, the taller, that sort of thing. But think about the context sensitivity, right? The sense of tall, you know, the sense of height that corresponds to being tall if you're a tree is different than if you're a boy, right? A tall boy wouldn't be very tall for a tree, or a tall building, right? A tall tree wouldn't be very tall for a building. So that so what tall means has some kind of inherent context sensitivity. Something like this, like, you know, tall tree, tall in the context of tree means something like greater than the mean value for trees on the dimension of height. And you could write this in some kind of a simple program, and, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert in lambda calculus, and I just hacked this up quickly, so excuse me if there's a mistake here, but basically what we're saying is tall is some function which will take in an instance and a, and a class and say, is it true that this thing, x, is tall relative to that class? And then we're, we're describing the formal content there, which is something like check if the height of, of x is greater than the mean of the height of some sample. So we, we want to assume we have some function which can sample instances of the class. Say we do that 10 times, we take a little statistical sample of the height, we take the mean, and we check if x is greater than the mean. Now, I'm, I, I go through the trouble to write it out like this because I think many of you might look at this definition and say, well, is that the right definition of height? I mean, of, of, of tall? What do you think? much greater. 
Yeah, yeah it might be much greater. Might be like we might say greater than one standard deviation above the mean. Right? <laughs> it's not just enough to be in the top 50%, right? So then we, we can write that down with a slightly more complicated function, right? Um, or, you know, maybe it's not one, maybe it's 0.5 deviations, and we don't know, right? Maybe there's just a free parameter here that has to be estimated along with the structure of the program. Or it turns out when we started looking at this, we actually did experiments in psychophysics, it seemed like some kind of more sort of ordinal statistic, like quantile. So maybe it's more like greater than the 65th quantile of trees on the dimension of high mu, and you can write that down too. And we did experiments, which I won't really go through the details of the experiment, but basically we gave people various um, distributions of things. This is just showing you some of the stimuli, and they had to pick out the tall ones. Right? And then we tested various models of what tall could mean. Is it defined by some number of standard deviations above the mean? Is it defined by some sort of non-parametric quantile statistic? We also found a lot of success with cluster models in which it seemed like what tall might mean is cluster the objects along the dimension of height and then find the highest cluster, and that's the tall ones. And we were able to not really distinguish very clearly between those models on at least one of these experiments, but later experiments we were able to kind of tease apart from them. It's a somewhat messy story, like a lot of semantics. But the point I want to draw your attention to is that we need to be learning with a hypothesis space that looks like those things. Um, now, suppose you want to, you, you want to go, go beyond this. Well, the, the, one of the interesting things we, we see when we look at gradable additives is that, well, there's a whole class of words that have this form, and we might want to be able to capture that semantic abstraction, right? So a whole class of words which have a meaning like this, relative to some class C, it's greater than some quantile on some dimension. And we can write down that abstraction, right, as a higher level kind of lambda. And I think there's evidence that kids actually learn that in the sense that once they sort of get the idea of how these adjectives work, they can now learn new gradable adjectives for new dimensions very quickly because they understand how they work. Or take something like good or strong, which are particularly interesting ones, where unlike tall, like for tall, the dimension is fixed as part of the word meaning, right? Like tall refers to the dimension height. But good, it's, it sort of has a category-specific dimension, right? Like a good man is different from a good cheeseburger, is different from a good conference, right? In each case, you, you, the class doesn't just specify the reference set that you're going to compute with. It also specifies what's the relevant variable. So for, for men, you know, a good man is something maybe like ethical, whereas for cheeseburger, it's some dimension of taste, and for conference, it's some dimension of you know, intellectual and social stimulation or whatever, right? And so good is, is a similar kind of word, and strong is kind of like that, but even more abstract. So these are hard, but, but you know, approachable challenges, I think. Um, here's some work that Steve Piantadosi has been doing. He wrote a very nice thesis looking at um, a bunch of different sort of aspects of learning functional language. One, one uh, case study that he looked at was the case of learning to use basic number words, like one, two, three, and so on, partly because there's been a lot of empirical work recently in the last decade or two in cognitive science looking at how kids learn these words. So the kind of task that you do with kids here is you might say, you know, can you count the balloons? And pretty early on, you know, by, by age you know, two and a half for smart kids, um, they're able to do that, smart kids in our society, so they'll go, you know, they'll learn a counting routine, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And if there were 10, they might know up to 10, and they could go one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Um, but there's evidence that that's really just a, a learned routine, not a real semantic abstraction. And one way to test where the kids really understand what number words mean is the so-called give end task. So you ask the kid, can you give me three balloons? So if you take a kid who has no trouble counting up to three or certainly to six, and you say, can you give me three balloons? Well, at, at, at the age in which kids are first able to do the counting thing, uh, they're not very good at that. Um, they, might not, they might give you a random number. Or in typical age of, say, two years, 10 months, kids are at a stage of what's called being a one-knower. That means if you say, can you give me one balloon, they'll give you one balloon. But if you say, can you give me two or three or four balloons, they'll just give you some arbitrary number more than one. <laughs> um, that's not, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more, inter or more, more subtle than that, but that's more or less what happens. And then a few months later, kids be become a two-knower, right, around age three, typically. These are just hypothetical ages. So they, if you say, can you give me one balloon, they give you one. If you say, can you give me two, they give you two. If you say, can you give me three, they'll give you some number more than two. Sometimes three, sometimes four, and so on. And then there's a three-knower stage, which takes another few months. And you could imagine going on and on like that, four-knower, five-knower, and <laughs> sooner or later they'll get to you. <laughs> Whatever. But it doesn't work that way. There's this really interesting leap of abstraction that happens. Uh, typically, after the three-knower stage, occasionally there's a brief four-knower stage where kids suddenly get all the other word meanings. Not that this isn't the same as kind of discovering discrete infinity, the idea that there's no largest number. It's more that all the numbers which are in their counting routine, so all the numbers that they can access when they go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on, 
now they understand how to fix those cardinalities in this give end task. So somehow we want to explain this learning curve. Why it takes actually a relatively long time, why you get this characteristic sequence of nowhere stages, and then there's this, there's this interesting kind of leap of abstraction to the, what's, what's called the CP or the cardinal principle in this literature. So the way Steve tried to tackle this is he said, you know, he's starting to give something that looks like a real language of thought here, give various kinds of primitive functions that could be useful for expressing numerical knowledge, and you know, write all of these in lambda calculus, which allow you to express various kinds of, of, of states of knowledge. So you can write down a three-knower as, as a sort of higher order function. You can write down a, um, a, the cardinal principle knower up there, which uses recursion to basically count down the count list and, and map that correspondingly to the, to the set sizes. You can have also weird things like a two-not-one-knower or a two-n-knower. Uh, or you can have other, you know, other kinds of languages have count systems which are more like singular plural, just one, you know, anything more than two is, or anything more than one is, is, is two. And the reason why this is interesting from a cognitive science point of view is because people have emphasized there's this sort of, you know, uh, uh, it's, a, it's kind of poverty of the stimulus, if you like, but there's this, un, you know, the, the possible way to map words onto cardinalities is not really determined by the data. And we wanted to be, have a hypothesis space that was able to express not only the actual uh, lexicons that children go through, but, but many other possibilities. And so then um, Steve did various simulations where he imagined, you know, that there are, he simulates a child who's, you know, getting uh, mostly true but sometimes noisy data of an adult or a competent speaker, you know, referring to the cardinality of a set. And um, the, they uh, uh, basically have a sort of Bayesian program learning setup here where you have a prior over those expressions, which is basically a minimum description length kind of prior, and then a likelihood, which is how well does that explain the observations, taking into account the possibility of noise, which could come from the fact that you're getting data, you know, it's possible somebody's using the words incorrectly, but it's also, it's more often the case that, you know, you might have, um, if you don't really understand the pragmatics of how these words are used, you might have, say, these four glasses here, but somebody could say, well, I'm going to take two glasses. Like, you could use a number that isn't necessarily just referring to the obvious cardinality of the set, and we wanted to build in that kind of robustness. Now, the, the natural thing that any machine learning person should be asking here um, is, you know, if you're going to define a, a prior over all these programs and learn in that, like, could this possibly work, or how, how could you make inference practical? It's not some simple convex optimization, and it's, we don't have an easy solution to that. Um, what we're doing is, is the kind of thing that, that probably most people in machine learning would blanch at, which is we're doing kind of MCMC in, in defined in a probabilistic grammar over these expressions. So I won't really go through the details, but basically this is this MCMC algorithm was worked out originally by Noah Goodman, and it's the same inference algorithm basically as in the church uh, probabilistic programming language, which involves making basically having a having a, a program derivation trace um, and then making proposals where you take some, you cut off that program trace at some point in the, in the tree and sort of resample a, a, a new possibility and you know, accept or reject in Metropolis Hastings style. It's amazing that it works at all. It's not very efficient. We obviously need to do better. But it's, it's enough that on these sorts of tasks, you're able to effectively search a very large space of lexicons. There's some, you know, the, the number of um, possible number languages here that, that this, this algorithm searches, it searches, you know, tens of thousands of hypotheses. And then when you look at the learning curve, that is, you look at, as a function of the amount of data that the child receives, um, what, uh, what concepts do they learn in what order? Well, you know, lo and behold, they actually do the thing, this, this learner does the thing that children do, namely, the highest scoring uh, sort of number lexicon uh, initially is the one knower, and then there's a stage of two knower, and then a stage of a three knower, and then fairly quickly you get the CP knower. And the other sort of four, five, and six knowers, and so on, just at this point, basically, are, are, are too complex relative to the fit of the data, whereas that CP knower with the leap to that recursive function winds up being the best account of the data. So if, if you like, it's a kind of Bayes' Occam's razor meets probabilistic program induction. And it was, this, is, this is really the first model in the cognitive science literature that was able to explain this characteristic number learning curve. Steve applied the same kind of approach to learning quantifiers, and I won't you know, go through the details, but basically he defined a similar kind of lambda calculus representation for sort of standard set relational quantifiers like none, every, some, and most, basically did the same kind of Bayesian learning setup and was able to show that these um, quantifiers could be learned and to get similar kinds of learning curves. Now the data on the order in which children learn these, these, uh, these uh, or sorry, these, these, uh, these, these quantifiers is not as clear. It hasn't been the study of such extensive case studies, 
But you know, now that we have models that make these predictions, it's motivating uh, language development researchers to go out and, and check on this. Um, how much time do I have? Ten, Ten minutes? Okay. Um, so the last sort of set of things I want to come back to is uh, what I was trying to motivate at the beginning. It's, it's part of, for me, the motivation to think about program induction, but also it's, it's this idea that, that is one of the most sort of deepest important ideas in developmental psychology that sits between language acquisition and conceptual development more generally. It's sometimes called the theory theory. This idea that children's knowledge is organized into these intuitive theories that are abstract systems of concepts that are kind of like scientific theories in some way, and that what words mean, of these in particular words that refer to abstract concepts that don't have a direct perceptual grounding, but are really important to how children think about the world, because they label the, the concepts that children think, and how they learn to think, how we learn to understand things that we don't directly observe, but we learn about through a combination of observation and, and linguistic interaction with others. So it's this idea that we, we need to be able to capture uh, you know, hypothetical candidate word meanings as some kind of abstractions in an intuitive theory. And we got that originally by starting to look at you know, learning causal models, this, this sort of uh, stuff that we're all familiar with, like um, you know, directed, directed acyclic graphs that can capture causal relations. This is a sort of a QMR-like network, if you're familiar with the classic disease symptom ones, but there's an extra set of variables which capture these risk factors. And the standard kind of Bayesian causal learning approach would be to put down a prior on DAGs, um, which you know just possible directed acyclic graphs on these 12 variables, and observe patients who are samples from this causal model. And you could try to do causal learning from sample data. It's a really hard problem to learn to do structuring like this in a completely bottom-up way with a generic prior. And in work that we and others were doing on uh, just purely on causal learning, we didn't think that we were studying semantics. But I'll show you why we, we came to that. Um, we said, well, maybe you could do causal learning much better if you had a higher level hypothesis, some kind of abstract intuitive theory of this domain, which divides the variables into these several classes. We we'll call them behaviors, diseases, and symptoms. And if you know that, um, let's say, these variables, working, factory, smoking, some are in that category of behaviors, and flu, bronchitis, lung cancer, and so on are the disease category, and headache, fever, uh, coughing are symptoms, and you have this, this schema that says all the causal links go from behaviors to diseases and diseases to symptoms, and so the, you have, you're only going to be learning a DAG which fits that high-level schema. That's a hugely useful constraint for causal learning. It cuts down the hypothesis space from, from the, hypothesis, the space of all possible DAGs on 12 variables, which is super exponential, right, in the number of nodes or variables. It's something like 521 gazillion. Um, it's really quite big. Um, but if you have that high-level knowledge, it cuts it down to only 131,000, and learning is much more efficient. Now, the reason why this is interesting from a machine learning point of view is that we don't just have to wire that in as some kind of you know, hand-coded knowledge, but we came up with, with a way to learn that, actually. This was work that uh, Tom Griffiths and Charles Kemp and I started doing, but the actual machine learning side was done by Vakash Mansinga uh, as part of his, his undergrad and master's thesis. So what he worked out was basically a way to, um, I, I, I sort of, for reasons of time, kind of left off most of the math, but basically he worked out a way to, um, you know, go back to this one, he worked out a way to define a, a non-parametric Bayes kind of Chinese restaurant process uh, prior over groupings of variables, which uh, subject to the groupings, one of which is shown up on top, then that gives you a prior on graphs here. It's basically just a kind of a, a probabilistic version of what you can see up there. And then you do inference at both of these levels, where at the top level, you're, make, you're sort of uh, trying to decide which class the different variables go in. And then subject to that, that clustering up there, that puts a prior on graphs. And so then you're doing inference at this level, basically looking at, looking at possible arrows, which way the causal arrows go. So the inference here consists of MCMC at, at these two levels, just for the two discrete variables of class membership of the variables and which edges exist in the graph. And it's, it's, it's quite remarkable how well this is, this is able to work. Uh, it's, it doesn't, you know, it's, we didn't figure out how to scale it to very large problems. But what we showed was how to take you know, re these relatively small graphs, which are still very, very hard to learn from. Like, Here's a two-layer two sort of disease symptom graphical model, which requires something like a thousand samples to learn uh, with high accuracy if, you ju if you're just learning with a completely generic prior. But if you allow yourself to learn at this higher level, where you consider the possibility that the nodes could be divided into these groups, and then that puts a prior on the graphs, then you can learn from you know, an order of magnitude less data, maybe only 80 samples, and with even just 20 samples from that graph, you can identify those abstract classes. You can figure out that the first six variables are kind of the causes, and the next 10 variables are the effects. And that's, you know, get that kind of getting the big picture first is a very human-like kind of learning. 
But it's also about semantics, right? Because words like diseases and symptoms, those are words that are important for, for our intuitive concepts of, of you know, intuitive theories in medicine. And what, what are they? They're not nodes in the graphical model, but rather they're labels for these more abstract concepts. And if you want to understand how those words get learned, we need ways of generating their word meanings, which this kind of hierarchical Bayesian learning is, is able to do. Um, sort of an even greater extension of this was some work that Noah Goodman and Tomer Ullman did, where they said, well, suppose we describe that the abstract knowledge that's shared across different causal networks with some kind of first-order logic theory that basically winds up capturing the sort of pearl intervention semantics of cause. So in a sense, we, we call this learning to be causal, because this is basically uh, a learner who, who knows about directed asymptotic graphical models, but doesn't understand the, the pearl intervention semantics of what it really means to be a cause, a sort of, sort of uh, error-breaking semantics. And I won't go through the details, but basically by searching over a space of first-order laws that characterize what it means to be an intervention, this system is able to learn how interventions work and use that to learn better causal learning. So it's, in a sense, it's kind of learning what the word cause means. Um, the, the, the last example I want to give is, is again, sort of, sort of core theory theory stuff. Um, it's the, the, there's, there's this term from, from philosophy, philosophy of science and philosophy of language, called conceptual role semantics, which I won't go through this, this quote because time is short. But basically, th there's th this idea that words take their meaning by referring to, to concepts which have some kind of abstract relational role. You can see this very clearly in the, the, in the classic scientific theories, like what does force and mass mean in Newtonian mechanics? Um, or energy or momentum. Those words cannot be defined if, as philosophers of science would say in observation language. There's no way to sort of write a definition in terms of um, you know, x's and x dots for what uh, force is. You can define acceleration that way, but you can't define force and mass. On the other hand, the way you define force and mass is you say f equals ma, and then you observe some objects in motion, and you can, you can parse that. You can read off what the forces and masses are likely to be. In other words, the words are defined by their, their meaning in that conceptual system. Um, so this, this is this idea of an intuitive theory that, uh, that, that specifies these laws and these concepts. When I, when I was giving Mendelian genetics, I mean, I, I went through this uh, you know, quickly, but it's that, that's the kind of thing we're talking about, like these concepts like gene, allele, recessive, dominant, phenotype, genotype. Those are technical words in biology. Which, you know, what do they mean? They, 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 you can't define them in terms of peapods, right? They're these abstract concepts, which when you understand the role they play in the theory, then you know what they mean. And you know what they mean because you know how to use them to make sense of the data you observe. So places where this kind of uh, business comes up a lot in human learning, human semantic learning, is, for example, in intuitive psychology. So if, if you saw, the, I showed some of these demos uh, yesterday in the language and vision workshop, but, you know, just to... Uh, show for those of you who haven't seen them or, or remind you, uh, you know, you, you can show infants um, these two balls rolling around on a green surface, but, but adults and even young infants see this as something kind of psychological or intentional, like the blue one is chasing the red one, or in this classic hyder and symbol business here, you know, you could see this as two triangles uh, moving and a circle moving, but people actually see it as more like, you know, a big guy kind of maybe bullying or beating up on this little guy, scaring you away, that guy's hiding, you know, we see you see psychology in even fairly simple motion like this. Mm -hmm. So what is this, what's the, what's the intuitive theory here? Well, this is some exam example of some work from Chris Baker in our group, where he tried to say, all right, here's a basic theory of a, of a sort of intentional agent. Um, you have actions that you can observe, and those are caused by goals and beliefs, and a rational agent basically tries to, to choose actions or plan sequences of actions which lead to, you know, like, likely to lead to the, to the achievement of the goal subject to their beliefs. And you can add in other things, like the goals are drawn from some prior, which is the notion of preference. Beliefs are formed by perceiving the world with some kind of general world knowledge. And again, these are the, the, the meanings of words that are absolutely critical in, you know, in, in, in the kind of abstract concepts that children use when they're learning about how to understand people's behavior. Words like goal or belief or action or agent or preference. You know, what do you know? What do you prefer? Well, the meanings of those words, the claim is, are basically these the structures in this kind of abstract probabilistic model. And uh, I'm probably out of time. Um, so uh, what we've done, this is the point which I also stopped, uh, skipped <laughs> in yesterday's talk. Sorry for uh, that. But um, anyway, so, so we've, we've, we haven't built models here of, of how you can learn this kind of a theory. 
And we haven't really tried to, to do word learning. What we have done is try to build models of how this theory works, how people can use a probabilistic model defined in this way to make sense of agents' goals or make sense of their joint uh, preferences and beliefs, like to, re to watch somebody moving around an environment and try to infer what they want and what they know. And we think this provides the, the hypothesis, basically, basically, for these abstract word meanings. It's not perceptual grounding. It's, I call it cognitive grounding, because the words correspond, I mean, but, but, but it plays the role that you, might, that you want perceptual grounding to work, only allowing you to deal with these abstractions, because the theory as a whole is what's grounded in perceptual experience, and the words refer to pieces of the theory, basically. So just to wrap up then, um, I told you about a program of research that is you know, very much in progress, and the language aspects of it are particularly very much in progress. P people are interested in working on this, you know, please come and talk to me. But these, these aspects of, of one-shot learning, learning to learn, learning abstraction, learning content sensitivity, learning function words are absolutely important. And we think that this toolkit of learning with the sufficiently rich representations, things that basically come down to probabilistic programs, where learning is a kind of program induction, is at least a, a, a way forward for us. There's really hard inference problems, which again, we, we, need, we need your help on that. But we think that at least this is, this is opening the door to how the, the most interesting parts of semantics might be acquired.